Hello and welcome. My name is Madhuri Ja. My pronouns are she, hers. I am the director of the Kennedy Satcher Center for Mental Health Equity. We are an entity of Satcher Health Leadership Institute here at the Morehouse School of Medicine. It is my sincere pleasure to welcome you back to the final installment in our five-part roundtable series, Criminal Justice and Equity, Bridging the Gaps. This series has been made possible through generous sponsorship from the WellPath Cares Foundation. Since January, we have brought you a monthly convening of leadership devoted to advancing outcomes for the justice and forensic involved. We began with policy and data, navigated through the intersection of mental illness and incarceration, imagined trauma-informed systems, candidly examined pathways to recidivism. And today we look at the role of housing access and environmental support and how they play uh, towards amplifying pathways to thriving when someone is released. We have featured organizational leaders, clinicians, policymakers, law enforcement personnel, and have prioritized the inclusion of leaders of lived experience, something that we will aim to do in every one of our convenings at the Kennedy Satcher Center moving forward. I am so excited to introduce you to the all-stars that make up today's final roundtable. but first we return to final remarks from our co-founder, Patrick J. Kennedy. We will then take a short break to ensure our speakers are set up to begin, and we'll start our panel. Thank you, Madhuri. On behalf of Dr. David Satcher, uh, former Surgeon General and myself, we want to thank you and all those who've been supporting this effort, particularly our friends at the WellPath Foundation, for your uh, work on the last uh, five webinars, today being the fifth and final one, to really focus on reforming our criminal justice system, which is in such great need to be uh, changed. We, we cannot continue to be the leading industrialized nation in the world to incarcerate more of its citizens on a per capita basis than any other free country in the world. It's just a, an indictment on us that we haven't come up with better solutions. And today's webinar, just like the other ones, had been to really curate those solutions and be ready for the moment where we finally can get this change in our American public policy, both at the federal, state, and local level. So thank you all for participating on today's panel and uh, please stay involved with the Kennedy Satcher Center. We are going to continue to push uh, better public policies, uh, really, uh, with the leadership of Dr. David Satcher, who did the first Surgeon General's report on mental health, in addition to the work at the uh, Kennedy Forum to really push parity implementation so that we can break down these real silos in our healthcare system that have too long marginalized to vulnerable populations and separated mental health from overall health. A lot of work to do, but we've had great uh, panelists like we do today helping us do that work. And again, thank you, Madhuri, for your leadership all along the way. And thank you again to WellPath Foundation for sponsoring this effort. All right, without further ado, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce you to our four panelists for today's discussion on housing access and environmental support. Tara Lawyer Harper unfortunately could not attend due to a personal emergency, but in her place, we are pleased to welcome Jason Bryant, a leader of lived experience and the director of programs at the Crop Organization. We are very excited to have Schroeder Stribling, CEO of Mental Health America and former executive director of N Street Village. Dr. Sarah Vincent, associate professor of psychiatry and pediatrics here at the Morehouse School of Medicine and Alexis Rosales, executive director of business development at Gateway Foundation Incorporated. Welcome to all of you and thank you so much for joining us today for this culminating discussion in our five part series. As we go through the questions, I ask you all to think about your role, the specific work you do for the justice involved and how you feel it translates to equity. I encourage you to channel your own identity and how it influences sustained success in your work. A reminder that you can use the raise hand function to be looped into a question directed to one of your peers. You can also go like this, I will see you. We can tag you in as you feel inspired to respond. Audience members, we have received some questions ahead of time that if we have time at the end, we will ask the panelists. Otherwise, you can also send them through the Q&A. We will see which ones we can feature given the time that we have. I have found it um, endearing as well that you use the chat to connect with each other res respectfully as you respond to our panelists' expertise. We, we encourage you to continue to do so if it helps you uh, take in the information that we'll discuss today. 
So we're going to start with our opening question, which I think is one all of you can speak to. What I'm especially excited about in this uh, panel is how diverse the expertise is that we have here and the different disciplines that have come together. Um, Jason, I'd like to start with you. Please, if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself, the crop organization, and tell us when you think about housing and environmental support, you know, with the impact it has on, on folks who are exiting the justice system. Sure. Well, thank you for that. So, um, as was shared, I do have lived experience. I committed a series of crimes in my early 20s that resulted in me receiving a life, a life sentence in the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitations. I served a little bit over 20 years inside. And I was in a very unique situation and blessed situation to have continued family support over the course of my incarceration. Um, so when I came home, I had a relatively soft landing. That being said, uh, of the <clears throat> thousands of individuals I met over 20 years of incarceration. It was few and far between to find people that had the level of support that I enjoyed. And I know many individuals who, when they were released from incarceration, struggled uh, profoundly to find some type of support in housing. And what I can say is true is this. It's almost impossible to get anything done if you don't have a roof over your head. And for the justice involved population who are coming out of incarceration, who have been severed in many ways from society, from the digital landscape, um, you know, don't have a good handle on uh, financial wellness, things of that nature, and also are encumbered with a, a heavy social stigma about a poor choice that they made in the past. The things that they have to do are often much more than the average citizen. Um, so you, you compound that problem with not having a roof over your head and it, it makes it almost an impossible situation. Um, so those are some, some of my early thoughts about the challenges of people coming out of incarceration, not having housing um, and how it stacks things against them um, in this mounting list of to-dos that they have in front of them. And, and we thank you as well for your willingness to share your own experience. You know, I think part of what we've learned too is just the value in being able to have that voice at the table is really important in understanding how complex the issues are. Schroeder, I'm gonna pull you in to answer the same question, not only because of your role at MHA, but as well at N Street Village, you just le you led the charge for housing programs, but I know you had a specific focus as well on the experiences of women. Um, so tell us what comes to mind for you uh, when you think about housing and environmental support for folks who are being released. Sure, well, thank you, Maduri, and, uh, and thank you to the um, Kennedy Satcher Forum for this series, which is really so very important, um, and I'm glad to participate. Uh, I'd like to share first about my experience at N Street Village, where we focused on the intersection of housing and mental health, and we had lots of folks who were justice involved, and we served mostly women, some families. Uh, we had several programs that received where women would come after they were uh, exited jail, some that were specifically designed for that. We had a recovery housing program, and then there were also women who would, um, once released, go into our either our permanent supportive housing, that was ideal, or sometimes to shelter if that wasn't available. Um, and one of the things that we know is that often a woman was unstably housed before she went to jail. So she might've been staying with an aunt or a cousin or a friend or the um, doubled up or tripled up the invisible homeless, as we say. And um, these arrangements are often stressful. They can change quickly. And often when you're um, incarcerated, you may lose that option. And so when you leave, you don't have it any longer. Um, we really worked to help folks get make that transition as easily as possible so we wanted to we had an in reach program where we would go into jails and let women know about what we had available in our recovery housing program one of the things we did we'd bring peers if we could uh, we brought a youtube video that the women of the program made so that we could show that to the 
um, women uh, who are incarcerated and encourage them to choose this as a housing option if they didn't have others. Um, what we know is that most of these women were had very complex situations that housing and homelessness was only one of them and I mean as as Jason was just saying that one is fundamental to everything else, but trauma was nearly universal many were coping with addictions. Um, many had charges because um, they were uh, using sex work as a way to support addiction, so they had solicitation or possession charges. A majority were African American, many were LGBTQ, and one particular challenge that I would raise because it's something we saw a lot, especially because we served women, was the particular challenges for trans women who are more vulnerable to violence in general and the difficulty for them of finding gender responsive housing. Um, so that was something that we really focused on. And we we defined um, the way we said, anyone who defines themselves as a woman was welcome. So uh, there were lots of uh, women in our program who were trans women. So again, many, many complex needs. And what we found was that having a place to land, wraparound supports, no defined time limit of how long somebody could stay that's really important in housing solutions so that you don't lose the gains that you make while you're stably housed there and having access to health and mental health resources immediately available was really important so many things to unpack in what you said i think also uh, you said gender responsive and i think also just culturally responsive care is a huge part of this as well so i want to pull dr vincent and alexa into alexis into this because both of you have both direct service provision experience but as well have consulted on system strengthening at a at a wider scale dr vincent i'll come to you um, you know, when you think about to family wellness, what that, what comes to mind for you for the impact that environmental support could have on someone, you know, what are you thinking of when you hear your peers comments on what's coming to mind for them. Oh, you're muted, Dr. Vincent. My apologies. Um, so thinking about uh, this topic. Um, so many people who go to prison who are incarcerated are parents. Um, they may have been separated from their children. Um, they may not be their primary custodian. Um, but that is one of those losses, one of those traumas that they often carry that aren't given um, as much attention. And when you're thinking about housing um, and doing it in a responsive way, considering the fact that they may have children that they might want to uh, be reunited with um, is a huge consideration that I think often goes under the radar. Um, and to you know, piggyback on the point about trauma, uh, we know that in the criminal justice system, it is grossly overrepresented, that most of the people there have a number of them, um, that usually they are undercounted, not diagnosed, not showing up in the diagnostic uh, classifications or the labels that have been placed on people. Um, and so part of that housing process too is giving people a foundation to start to do some of that repairing um, that really can't be done if they're not in a safe, stable place. Um, and when we look at substance use as well, often the upstream of that um, has to do with the trauma. And so, um, you know, it, it all often goes back to safety and security um, and housing is a piece of that. Um, and having that is one thing, but also having it be an environment that is created that accounts for those other things is, is incredibly important as well. And yet it seems what we've learned over the past four months so hard to attain, like a holistic space, you know, is something that still, unfortunately, we have a hard time imagining because of the resource needs, which I think, Alexis, you can really speak to. I think it'd be helpful for the audience too to hear a little bit about your work in the state of India, Indiana, prior to being a Gateway Foundation, since you've had such diverse exposure to the experiences of the formerly incarcerated. Sure. Thank you uh, so much for having me. Uh, as as you mentioned, the majority of my career was spent working for the Indiana Department of Correction and Reentry Capacity, both starting um, in the field as a substance use disorder counselor and then promoting throughout and up into the ranks of the executive team where we really focused on what are those holistic needs that we see in the population that are a necessity in order to be successful. Um, and then in my role here with Gateway Foundation, we're a nonprofit that provides substance use disorder treatment in prison and community corrections, um, different settings with folks who have been justice involved. 
And you know, the one thing that I do have to say is housing is probably the top issue that I don't think we've made the progress on that we have in other areas, right? We've seen a lot of progress made in the need for cognitive-based therapy. We understand just how many of the people who are incarcerated or who experience incarceration have a need for SUD treatment or have trauma, um, as Dr. Vincent touched on. But housing is an area where we haven't evolved as much. Um, we've really focused on the importance of second chance hiring. We've started to see business owners identify ways in which they can be more supportive as people are released and start removing um, the stigma that's attached to a felon and hiring people for the skill set they have and not the past that they bring with them. But with housing, we haven't made that progress. We still have a lot of people who say they want to be a part of the change, but then they don't actually want our folks living anywhere near them. They don't want them near their schools. They don't want them in their neighborhoods. They don't want them um, in, at their children in the schools. You know, it's, it's support from a distance, right? And so because of that, we don't see the resources funding wise um, or infrastructure wise that are supportive of, as you know, as Jason mentioned, if we, if we do a great job of getting you wraparound services for your, for your substance use disorder, if we're able to skill you um, up in a vocation that is, is a good paying job, none of that matters if you don't have a safe space to lay your head, if you don't have a way to provide for your family and for yourself. You know, as we look at the system as a whole, there are so many fines and restrictions that are, are on folks as they're released that are required of them. And without a place to live, how do we expect people to be successful in their release? And so I think that that's definitely an area where we just have so much work left to do. So you're, you're bringing up the issue of policies and historical policies that uh, I think have created barriers to access to housing. You know, Schroeder, I'm curious to know in your opinion, you know, you the way that MHA investigates this, I think is um, specifically unique because it's pretty holistic in the way that you all collect data on the experiences of others, but also at N Street Village. Why do you think housing continues to be left off the priority list? You know, when I think in this crew, we know that housing is critical and yet we, we are met with these policies and institutional challenges to make it a priority at, at a funding level. What comes to mind for you are some of those barriers? Well, for, first of all, I would emphasize the importance of the point and the fact that we have, we have evidence to indicate the importance of housing you know we know that housing first reduces rates of arrest and reincarceration etc we we uh, we know the solution so the question is well how do you how where do we um, ensure that we've got the the political will and the right incentives lined up and we need the cooperation of lots of different partners i think I think it is, it's a complex problem, and I think that's one of the reasons that it's hard to tackle, because we need the cooperation of, the, of these various sectors, so you need the affordable housing development community, you need the local community based clinical services, social support services, etc, and you need your uh, policy lined up, as well as your practice lined up with so many different partners. So I think it's it seems to people something that is very a, a complex pro problem and one that's very difficult to solve. And yet the solutions are pretty simple. I think some of what um, Alexis is saying, though, is really important. There's we need public support for the issue. And it's not an issue that where it's very easy to drum up uh, or predictable, perhaps, to drum up the public support that we need. And it, to Alexis's point about NIMBYism, for instance, you know, just even getting people in the public to understand the issues. And as you said, when we had a conversation last week, to approach them with compassion. So I think that's part of it. Stigma is is uh, with all these issues, stigma is so deep from addiction, incarceration, uh, trauma, the, the racism that's involved. The, the, these issues are so, the tentacles are so deep on these. I think it makes it much harder for us to have a uh, compassionate policy uh, perspective as well as um, develop the practice landscape that we know we, will solve the problem. Compassionate policy perspective. I think that's something I'm going to write down and try and say is something we should all practice. Jason, it looks like a lot is resonating with you. So I'd like to yeah. be Thank you. I just I just want to echo what Schroeder is sh sharing because, in my opinion, the source of most of our social woes 
are at the constructs of stigma and perspective. And just to give you just a little bit of context. So when I was inside and I began working with Prop uh, and the leadership, the current leadership, who's all now released, um, we had an opportunity to provide personal leadership training to college students from a uh, community college. And one of the most profound things was just seeing the light go off in their heads that we were not these monsters that were portrayed on TV and in movies. And that, that way of thinking is pervasive throughout our society. So in, in terms of a solution, like for one, we can look at how other countries do it. And we can see that, you know, whether we're talking about, you know, um, over in Europe or even in many African countries where the perspective is, these are our community members. These are our brothers and sisters. And our responsibility is to re-educate and reintegrate and get them home as soon as possible. If we can really begin to cultivate that conversation in the United States of America, things will change. And I believe the way to make a connection point is it doesn't matter what side of the aisle you fall, you fall on. Some people say, hey, we need to let them all go. Some people say, hey, we need to lock them all up. The reality is, is that people are coming home and everyone wants people who are coming home to succeed, to succeed. So regardless, irregardless of your perspective of incarceration, if we all can agree that when someone comes home, which they do come home, and we want them to succeed, then we need to find ways to find those solutions. And it sounds like leadership opportunities as well afforded to you while you're incarcerated, you know, is extremely important what that means. We learned that in our last session too with the Bard Prison Initiative being featured as a, a pathway to education while you're incarcerated so that you know that, you know, job employment access when you're released is a much easier. You know, if you can graduate with your bachelor's degree, your high school diploma while you're incarcerated, it means so much more. Alexis. Yeah, I think, um, you know, Jason definitely hit it on the head when we look at the ways that other countries approach people who are re-entering, the attitude is completely different. It's a community sense. It's a, what can we do to, to wrap around this person and help them succeed? And unfortunately here, the attitude is, that is a person that needs to prove themselves. Um, they need to prove that they can be uh, resourceful. They need to prove that they can be a contributing member of this society. And so when you put it into context of the very restrictive housing practices that exist, people are starting out already feeling as though they aren't supported. They have that stigma. And then there's policies and practices that support those stigmas. So there was a young woman that I worked alongside um, who had committed a violent crime, who had served a significant amount of time, and she had successfully completed her incarceration period. She had successfully completed her supervision. And 12 years later was still unable to rent apartments in certain locations. And so for as long as we continue to allow practices to always attach an asterisk to a person's name, where you know the, the sentence was the consequence, right? It, it, the time was served, the supervision was completed. And so that was supposed to be the end. And unfortunately, we still have so many practices in place, especially in the areas of housing, um, where that asterisk always exists for that person. And so if you're to tell us that 10 years, 20 years out, we can still be told, no, you're not allowed to reside here. And in certain areas where one landlord you know, operates a majority of the properties, we've essentially removed an opportunity for them to live in an entire block, an entire neighborhood, an entire city, because these practices are allowed to continue to be so restrictive and so stigmatized. Um, and so we'll continue to have that issue alongside the problem that Jason highlighted, which is that unfortunately, we don't wrap ourselves around people to look for support. We wait and look to see how they might fail to prove a point that they shouldn't have been given these second chances that they've earned. And you're, you're bringing into the intersectionality of housing discrimination, right? Because we know, obviously, brown and black communities have been discriminated against in housing policies forever, you know, and, and Daniel Dawes, who's our executive director at, at Satcher Health Leadership Institute, testified with the Ways and Means Committee about a month ago in a marathon to really address anti-racist practice in our policies and our tax policies and, and what do we do with that funding. And then you break it down even further in this asterisk you're talking about, Alexis, it's almost saying that it's a policy asterisk, it's a community asterisk, it's a family asterisk, it's a wellness asterisk, even your access, I can say as a clinical provider uh, to get mental health services is difficult. Um, but Dr. Vinson, you know, I think it's, it's also important to talk about best practices, you know, things that you've seen maybe work in reducing the stigma that we're talking about, you know, ensuring that someone gets the wellness outcomes that they are entitled to that we all believe are rights. Yeah, and I think it has a lot to do with what Jason mentioned. I think the most effective 
anti-stigma campaign is seeing a living, breathing human being in front of you and relating to them um, and understanding that there's so much more uh, to who they are than what is often presented. Um, and, you know, the reality is the people who have the privilege of uh, being mental health professionals, of having careers that require six, eight, 12 years of training, um, often do not have the same backgrounds as the people who are overrepresented in the criminal justice system. Um, and so there needs to be that education and there needs to be an acknowledgement of that gap between lived experiences that are often, uh, though not always there, um, and that really being incorporated into how we train and teach um, our mental health professionals. And another thing I'll say too is um, when we think about housing or resources more broadly, um, you look at who is over and involved in the criminal justice system, and it's the groups of people that we have decided are not as valuable to society as a whole, whether that's people with disabilities, with intellectual limitations, who are racial and ethnic minorities, who right, fill in the gaps. And so it speaks to this broader issue of um, the over-incarceration of the marginalized um, and what that means in a society where we just haven't made the decisions to consistently provide needs for everyone, right? And so in Atlanta, where we're based, housing is a problem whether you have a conviction or not, mm -hmm. if you don't make a certain amount of money, right? And so these broader things that we're grappling with as a society are going to disproportionately impact these groups even more. Um, and then you add incarceration on top of it and it becomes really complex and challenging. So it's not the best and the most fun part of the discussion, but I think part of this is how we capture the burden of need, you know, and so I always think about data and, and the influence that that has and, you know, a lot of um, our panelists in the series have been commenting that it that going to prison or going to jail often becomes a vacuum where someone is kind of eliminated in terms of their role in society, they have a statistic as a carceral participant and then when they exit it's like that that body of information disappeared um, so we've talked a lot about through lines and data and how that can be helpful but also what we need to do to better capture the experience of someone so that these you know complex issues you all are addressing can be better addressed um, you know shorter I'll pull you in in terms of how you think data influences equity for the justice involved but you know when you're thinking about environmental support, you know, what's worked in understanding needs at a at a level where you can say, well, this is where a burden of a problem is. Uh, this is how many people in this area are formerly incarcerated, for example, and what can we do to better improve resources. But I want to pull data into this because I think that's a solutions oriented thing we often think about in policy as well. I completely agree. And I think it's a really important point. And I guess my first and primary point would be that we don't have nearly enough data that we need to deal with the problem and that and I and I think that in and of itself is indicative of stigma and discrimination right that that we haven't chosen to look in these areas we haven't chosen to study these things because they are often so often cast aside or negated in our um thinking and and um all too easily in our policy. So I would say that you know we we do need focused attempt, but but just take a few like the, here's a, a data point that I, the type of thing that I think we need more of that and kind of goes to my point about um, or focus on the LGBTQ vulnerability that um, there was a study of 220 transgender women in, in recent years, um, ages 16 to 19 in Boston and Chicago, and almost 20% were incarcerated at least once during uh, a single year, and that their odds of being incarcerated were twice as likely if they were a person of color, four times if they were doing sex work, twice as likely if they had trauma, and more than twice as likely if they were homeless. So that tells us about the great vulnerability of certain populations, and this is the kind of data that, uh, that I think that we need. We also need to examine the impact of, of policy and look at the data that flows from it. So for instance, we know that there are 48 states that have 
at least one law that restricts some behavior that might be related to people experiencing homelessness. So camping, for instance, in public places or loitering and, and vagrancy um, in certain places. That's 48 states. So there, so how it, see how easy it is the, to fall from, you know, the causal relationship flows in each direction. It's more easily for people who are unstably housed or experiencing homelessness to uh um to be um to, to be charged or to go to jail and therefore it starts the whole cycle so i think to your point about data we really need to have a focused effort on what more do we need to know um so that we can really zero in on, on the issues jason i'm curious what do you think we need to know more of Right. I mean, what are the we know the classic things we capture about folks who might be incarcerated, but what do you think we need to know, know more about? That's thank you for asking me that question. So currently, you know, uh, crop has entered into a partnership with the state of California for three years and in launching a reentry program. And part of that partnership entails an evaluation, which is being conducted by UC Berkeley, the people lab. So I'm becoming really familiar with like data and dosage and, and things of that in, in order to like know how to run the program, make adjustments as needed and make sure that we're <clears throat> making the impact that we stated that we would. But when I really think about data, there's a, there's an, a distinction to be made between quantitative and qualitative, right? So we can amass an abundance of quantitative data about numbers and <clears throat> what's happening with these people over here and these people over there. But my experience has been the, the, the real value is in the qualitative stuff, which is harder to really capture. But when I went to prison at 20 years old in 1999, and it was widely known because the governor of California said, the only way that someone with a life sentence will ever get out of prison is with a toe tap. Mm. If, you are, if you have a life sentence, you are basically consigned to die in a six by nine concrete cage like how do you get at that data how do you get at how that can Im impact an entire culture and you know i'll say this with <clears throat> with sobriety and uh and humility and appreciation for my parents if it wasn't for their support it would have been easy for me to succumb to the temptation of despair that existed in the prison that i was housed at because it was all around me, despair like this is it this is our life so that qualitative data to me is paramount. Like what are people's experiences? How are we as a society justifying the othering of human beings, relegating them to second-class citizens, to people who deserve to be treated like animals, deserve to be punished? Yeah, they made poor choices, but when did we as a society decide that the purpose of prison is to punish? versus to rehabilitate our fellow humans, right? So that qualitative data of like the experiences that we as a society are saying, this is okay to treat our fellow citizens, our, our fellow human beings, um, that's what I think we really need to get after. Um, so the, the lived experience of people who are going through it, um, as well as a checking in of our own like experiences, like how we justify it. And the visibility you bring to that too is really powerful because if we don't take time to listen, how do we know? You know, I think as a therapist, that's the only way I can do my job, but not everyone has my role. I do think though the experience of workforce in carceral systems too is really important here and understanding how that plays out. So, you know, one of the comments that was made in, in our last panel was the mixed experience of compassion versus lack of compassion of folks who are workforce professionals in the carceral system, right? So how we capture those experiences, I think is really important. Um, so Alexis and Dr. Vincent, I'd like to pull you in too, in terms of how do we capture the experiences of the workforce that are supporting people who are incarcerated? To Jason's point, if it's meant to be a, a rehabilitative space, and yet, obviously, it is clearly traumatizing and causing despair for all. So Alexis, maybe I'll pull you in first. Sure. So, um, you know, having spent the better part of my adult life working in the correction system, I've seen a lot of really wonderful, compassionate, um, caring, supportive people who who make up that workforce, right? Folks who believe that there is there is change, that there are second chances, that what they do day in and day out 
make a difference in their life and the life of the people that they encounter, whether that be um, in a jail, in a prison, in a community corrections, in a, in a mental health facility, wherever they are, where those folks don't necessarily have the ability to just come and go freely, they make that impact. The unfortunate truth of that is that in that time and in that career, I've encountered people who do not um, meet any of those definitions. They are, are not compassionate. They um, don't believe in second chances. Uh, they, they don't think what they do matters. And you know, you often ask yourself, how do you get up and, or I do at least, how do you get up and do a job every day that you don't believe in, that you um, don't think makes, makes any matter? It's just a way that you survive on a daily basis. And you know, you see people who maybe came in with that attitude and over the years, the experiences that they've encountered have changed the way that they view other people. I, I can say for myself, having worked most of, of my adult life, I've changed as a person who I am today versus who I would have been had I not worked in the, the criminal justice world are, are different. And there's a lot of good differences. And there are some things that that because of experiences I've had, I wouldn't say that they're the best differences of, in myself. You know, Maybe I'm a little less open, maybe I'm a little more cautious because of things that I've encountered. Um, but I think what we have to continue to do is focus on the stories that show that what we do matters and that there, there is progress, You know, whether that be stories like we hear from Jason. I mean, just hearing him speak, just goosebumps, right? Like you know, getting to see, he reminds me of so many people that I got to see find that success and be the person that I, you know, I think they're meant to be and, and focusing on that instead of focusing so much on the negative. And I think that oftentimes we get caught in, in that, that loop of all of the negative and, and in getting out and getting to speak, especially on college campuses and getting the opportunity oftentimes to bring students in to, you know, incarcerated settings and allow them to see and talk to the people that, you know, they've had this stigma or this judgment about really changes people. And so seeing that, you know, that living, breathing person and not just a number or not just a character in a show or not just a story, you know, that really makes the difference. And I do think that when I look, um, just as, as we talk about people who are justice involved and there's those people who are examples of, you know, why we see some of that negativity, we have, they're the minority. And the same can be said for the workforce, in my opinion. There, there are a lot more people who are on the positive side, who believe in that second chance, who come in to make the difference than there are that aren't. It's just, unfortunately, we always hear, you know, from those who are the loudest. And oftentimes that's the negativity on kind of both sides of that. So that's been my, my experience. I think what you're talking about too is something that we're trying to ensure we do as well, um, at least in our role in equity is measuring resiliency, right? Like measuring strength, measuring healing. Um, what exists that's actually working really well is something you're right that I think in general with marginalized populations, we don't do a good enough job of because it's always capture the problem. And then, you know, I think in the health professions, it becomes then the characteristic of that person, whether that be their risk, um, excuse me, their race, their gender status, their sexuality, if those are intertwined with each other, that is the risk for the negative outcome, right? Which is extremely dangerous. Very, very dangerous to say that that's true. So Dr. Vincent, I want to pull you in too, because you research this, you're also a consultant in this space, you're also a provider in this space. You know, when you think about measuring resiliency, where have you seen the value of that? You know, what do you, what's coming to you when you hear your colleagues here in this panel? Yeah, so one of the things that, you know, I would say too is, is the daughter of a retired probation officer and, and police officer who really saw her job as, as a ministry um, is, is that a lot of people who go into the work do go into it well-intended. Some of the people, once they see how the system actually works or they experience um, how they're treated within it, leave or they have to figure out some way to sort of climb the ranks and change the culture. And so I think an important part of the conversation isn't just about the workforce, but about the workforce's environment, about the system, about what they're heading into. And you know, there's often discussions about burnout. And one of my dear mentors, Dr. Alpha Stewart, always talks about, is it burnout or is it arson, right? When you have a system that can hold over a correctional officer for an additional 12 hours with little to no notice, 
whatever compassion they have is going to be in shorter supply over time. So we can't just look at the people, we have to look at the processes, the procedures, the system around them, and really um, understand that what we're seeing often with the people, their burnout, the things we may see as a lack of compassion, a lot of times that is the most outward manifestation of a systemic problem in terms of how things are, are set up. Um, so I think that's important, right? Like there's a, uh, there's benefit to connection. There's benefit to making people feel as if they're part of something bigger. When we're thinking about resiliency, um, believing that you are making a positive difference and that you see where you fit into the larger culture and goal is really important. Um, but if we focus on only resilience, the burden is on the person, the individual, the one who's receiving sort of this ill treatment rather than the root cause of it. And, and the intervention that could have the biggest effect, which is really thinking about humane conditions for the people working in this system um, as well. Yeah, I'll never forget someone who uh, told me about how she had worked at Rikers. So I was in New York City before I was here in Atlanta. She had worked at Rikers for about six or seven years. She was a social work supervisor and started feeling like she was manifesting the same traumatic stress that her clients in prison were. Um, being just afraid of who was behind her, being very time conscious because there were no clocks, right? Um, feeling like she didn't really know how to socialize. She would say things like it was affecting my family relationships, my romantic relationships. And the biggest thing that she had inside of her was guilt, right? If I walk away from this job, am I abandoning my client, which I think in the behavioral health space and, and in the, just in the helping professions in general, it's something that we deal with, right? Is that, are we being taken care of so that we can take care of others? Um, and it seems like that's kind of resonating with everyone. You know, Schroeder, you've been in this space for a very long time. What's coming up for you as you hear how we support a workforce that also can benefit from environmental support? Well, this is a challenging problem, especially now, of course, because of the pandemic and because of the, um, the all of the stress on frontline workers of, of every form and uh, including in the mental health workforce and in the health workforce and in the um, criminal justice world as well, too. And I think that the, the point is well taken about, you know, uh, the the not focusing only on resilience and making it the individual's issue as opposed to having it be a, a systemic or a workplace or the responsibility of um, leadership or localities to um, promote well-being uh, in the for people in those specific workplaces or localities, etc. And we need creative ways to solve for burnout. And I mean, we have to solve some workforce shortage issues, of course, and that it compounds the problem. And I love the Alpha Stewart quote about burnout or arson. And I can't. <laughs> that's a um, I think really well put because right right now sometimes it can feel like we don't have very many options. But if we get creative in our workspaces about being recognizing the signs of burnout, educating people about those signs, and then offering relief to whatever degree that we can. I think that's really important. Um, but I just, I wanted to, do you mind, Maduri, if I like pivot to one other point of, that yeah. was coming up and what people are saying? Because I hear in what all of my colleagues are saying here that um, a part of developing the the political will and the public will and energy that we need to address some of these systemic inequities and problems in order to get to a better future is really about developing compassion a compa as a compassionate society. And I thought you asked a provocative question in a good way when we talked last week about how we do that, basically. And a lot of what I hear, if you listen to Jason share his personal story or Dr. Vincent or Alexis talking about the impact on the individual of, get, of proximity as Brian Stephen would say, right? Proximity to people with lived experience. And so when you asked that question I, last week in our conversation, I walked away thinking about it and I thought, you know, it's really incumbent upon me too to share a personal experience. And since you mentioned Rikers, it fits right in that um, I have a family experience with the criminal justice system. I, um, 
my that I my father and I think it's important to share that so that we we are open about these things. My father, who was a Methodist minister, um, was uh, and this is a number of decades ago. He was somebody who came out of the closet late in life and was living as an openly gay man. But as he subsequently really struggled with a lot of mental health and substance abuse challenges after that, it was I think internally he was sort of at war with himself about whether there was something morally or spiritually wrong with him. This was the 1970s. We've fortunately on some things we, we've um, we've made some progress. Um, and in the in the 80s, he had contracted AIDS and his mental health took a further dive and he was involved in a drunk driving accident which injured someone. Um, he was known to have been leaving a, a gay bar and when the, he was arrested, the police were violent with him and he spent went was arrested and did and spent some time at Rikers Island where he was very, very terrified about um, being targeted because he was gay. Um, when he, he, he was unstably housed when he went there and when he left, he was homeless himself and he spent the rest of his life, um, he was in a, a Christian shelter in Manhattan um, and, and died a couple of years later. And this was in the 1980s. And I, I share this because I, uh, in my personal experience, you know, I know this good man, this good man was my father, this good Methodist minister was my father who had um, real challenges and challenging problems and um, not to say that he did not need to be accountable for his, his actions, certainly, but you can see the intersection of all these issues around identity that played in here that uh, are also relevant. So I wanted to share that and be open because I think it's important for everybody, for all of us to know, to investigate where our own compassion comes from, but also share our, our experiences with others so that we can all be as proximate as possible. And I thank you so much for that candor. You know, I think sometimes when we have roles of influence, like all of us do here, it's easy for us to forget A, why we do this. But I think B, um, the importance of sharing that story to, to others to understand that that is sort of what sustains us here. Um, it seems like you've also moved your colleagues quite a bit with your disclosure, you know, and I, and I appreciate that. I just want to pull you all in, you know, what what do you feel hearing the relationship that you'll have with each other too, in terms of understanding your own humanity and compassion being invoked in this discussion? I think that is why we chose to also invite you all to be, you know, pillars of strength that we can share with others that is hugely important. Um, but Alexis, I've noticed you've been nodding a lot. So I want to hear what's coming to mind for you. Sure. I think, um, you know, I entered the field you know, similarly to Schroeder with a family experience, um, I entered the field in, in the substance use disorder counseling realm because of my own family had experienced, um, you know, folks with, who struggled with substance use disorder and mental health um, diagnoses. And for me, it was wanting to help in, in an area where, to be honest, coming out of college, um, I wanted to understand more. And so part of the way that I felt I could understand more was to enter this helping field and, and maybe help others. And it's not uncommon to find people, you know, in this field. I feel like we always tend to share with our colleagues this level of compassion, whether it be a personal story that brought us into it, um, or once we got in the field, the compassion that grew from the people that we met and the clients that we've helped. And um, that's something that you can't teach. I, I just, you know, over and over again, you find people in this field who have stories similar to what Schroeder shared. And I'm so glad that it's um, becoming more and more acceptable. I think that when I started in corrections, you know, you were meant to be very closed off. And there was almost like a separate life of what what who you were um, in your real life is what I used to call it, right. And then who I was, when I was, you know, counselor Rosales um, in the field. And so it's been uh, good to begin to see how important it is to not only share, you know, my personal reason for entering the field, but, you know, stories like Jason's, you know, peers, people who have that lived experience, I've really appreciated how we've started to value what types of experience and information and education that peers bring into our field, whether that be mental health, whether that be substance use, whether that be incarceration. You know, I, I don't have that firsthand experience story to share. I don't have that firsthand experience of, of leaving incarceration after thinking I was gonna live my entire life there. 
And we can't place enough value on the type of support that peers provide um, to our clients. And so it's, it's wonderful to get the opportunity to sometimes look back on why you started, you know, your career this way and how it's grown um, and how just the field in general has progressed and has become more and more supportive, not only of those of us who are, are working in it, not with firsthand knowledge, but especially for the peers who are with lived experience, helping other people navigate the roads that they're more familiar with. The value is immense. There's, and there's something you said too that um, resonated with me because you said we're one way kind of outward facing in, the, in our day job. And then we internalize all these things that come up for us. And if we're, if we're the provider side, um, but how many times have we heard that from clients we've supported as well, where especially if they have a, a carceral history, I have to appear one way. And if I don't want anybody to find out, or it has to be masked that I have this kind of secret that I have to carry. It's been, a, it's been worded like that by several of my clients, you know, and the extreme experience I've seen, you know, I was a, a sort of community treatment director in New York, right? So it was mobile behavioral health. We were going to wherever our clients were. And a lot of them were being recently released into our care and the lack of safety felt, right? So I don't feel safe going anywhere because I don't know how to hide this part of myself in that, like, I haven't been given any resources to imagine life outside of prison. And yet life in prison was, as to Jason's point, full of despair, you know, but Dr. Vincent, Jason, are you feeling, yes, Jason, go ahead. Are you feeling yeah, yeah. at all? Well, I've, I've had a lot of thoughts bubbling as, as Schroeder and Alexis have been speaking. And uh, I, I think the first thing I want to share is, you know, for me, when I committed my crime and was incarcerated, uh, my first real epiphany was when I was arrested, it was at my parents' home. And uh, it was the first time in my life that I had seen my father cry. Um, mm -hmm. You know, a mess. And in that moment, I had this like vague understanding that my choices were never just about me, that they impacted the people I love the most. And that was really what kind of sustained me for my first 10 years of incarceration to not get into more trouble in prison when there was an abundance of trouble to get into. It was like, I didn't want to revisit that pain on my family. So I leaned into their support and began pursuing my education. But then 10 years into my incarceration, I reconnected with my co-defendant who had founded the CROP organization two years prior. And that is when I had my second real epiphany. And, and when we think about things like uh, empathy, compassion, um, and why we do this work. That's where I discovered all of that. Um, the compassion for me really developed when I considered a poem by John Donne, For Whom the Bell Tolls. And the premise is basically that, you know, when the bell tolls in the old days, that meant that someone had passed away. And, and it, the message was, don't ask for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee, because you're wrapped up in this thing called humanity. And when someone is gone, it's a part of humanity that is lost. And I looked around and and even though I had gotten pretty close to my bachelor's degree and had stayed out of trouble for the most part in 10 years, I, I, I noticed that I hadn't been contributing much to other people's lives. Mm. There were other people wearing the same suit as me, had very similar dreams, visions about freedom, um, being with their family, you know, successful in the community, but I hadn't been using my talents, whatever talents they might be, to contribute to their success. And that's when it really got, I got the idea that if you want to go fast, you go alone. But if you want to go far, you go together. Mm -hmm. We began building a community. And I think it was Friedrich Nietzsche, Nietzsche who said, if you can find a why to live for, you can endure almost anyhow. And we were very successful at doing that at the prison that we were incarcerated at. We could literally uh, uh, created a community of, of transformation of cultural transformation that invited people into a space where freedom was obtained before they were earned, before they earned the parole date. Um, so that's, I just wanted to share that as far as like the why we do this work and, and the empathy of like seeing that I'm a part of this thing called humanity and I'm excited and I do get burned out at times. Like these are, these are, you know, heavy conversations when you're helping people navigate a lot of the limiting beliefs that have been holding them back for so long or limiting beliefs in society about what is possible for people that have conviction records, right? It's, it can be emotionally draining, but, but I'm re-energized every time I'm in conversations and spaces with people like you who are, who are interested in, and really want to work on making this world a better place because, I mean, isn't that really the point of life? I think it is. I hope it is. My feeling <laughs> is that it is. But, um, you know, I think what we are talking about, there's a few words I'm hearing is community, collaboration, um, seats at the table, being visible. 
Um, you know, and I, I open this to all of you. So it sounds like all of those things are necessary, but not happening enough, right? When we're talking about environmental support or even just housing and how we, how we see someone's humanity when they're coming back into a community after being incarcerated. So who needs to be at the table? What is, what is the effective collaboration? What can we do better? And, you know, Dr. Vincent, I'll come to you first. What, does, what inspires you to think of who needs to be at the table to respond to some of the things our, our peers are bringing up? Well, I think you all have answered it that we really have to be um, intentional and deliberate about bringing more people with proximity to the table. Um, we have barriers when it comes to housing and these other things, but we have barriers when it comes to having a seat. And then sometimes even when you have a seat at the table, there may be barriers when it comes to having a voice. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you're someone who's around one of these tables and maybe you don't have a lived experience, your role may be helping to amplify what that person's saying to support them, to uh, make sure that they have space to speak. Um, because, you know, I am in so many rooms where I am the only Black person, or I am the only person from a rural area, or I am the only person with an uncle incarcerated for murder, right? Like, I can't, we, we need more. I, I don't want to be the only person anymore. Um, and, and I think that that speaks to, you know, part of the work, right, is, is helping to um, develop that workforce and helping them see themselves in those roles. Um, and that's why I've been at Morehouse School of Medicine throughout my career, where I get to teach and mentor and train people um, who have backgrounds that are more similar to the people who are, in, you know, involved with these, these issues. So um, that, that piece of, of mentorship and sponsorship um, for people who may not have those folks in their family or in their communities, I think is a big one and one that everybody in a position of authority and power is, is able to do. Go ahead, Schroeder. Oh, I'm just going to uh, pile on to all the great things that are being said here and um, just want to appreciate my colleagues for all these comments. And I, but it just making me think of a story from N Street Village, I think, because one of the, for, to answer the, your basic question, who, who needs to be at the table? First of all, I do believe people with lived experience must lead the way because how else will we know what the real circumstances are, what the real needs are, what the real effect of the carceral system has been in their lives or the, the lives of their family members? So we need people with lived experience to lead the way and we need to be willing to follow um, to follow that. So when I hear Jason talk about even developing a community of transformation inside that so that people could be free before they were through, that's beautiful. That is just a, such an extraordinary example. And it was making me think about this day that at I one day at N Street Village when I'd been there for a long time. So in this recovery housing community where people lived together, so people may have exited jail and many, dealing with complex problems, mental health, substance use issues, trauma, et cetera, women um, living together in, in group. Um, so, I mean, they had privacy, but they, you know, ate meals together and they did some programming together, et cetera. Um, and, and oftentimes for, for, for years, for a few years as they went on to their next steps in housing and community want, people want to heal. People want healing, and they also want to be of love and service to their neighbors. I believe that. I, you know, I believe that's part of what we. That's why we're doing what we do. I mean, that is what is what driving all of us to be in the um, working in the work that that we're in. And people need an opportunity for that. So people need an opportunity not just to be the recipients of charity per se, but they need to be involved in their community and they need that opportunity. And I was one day walking, I heard a commotion in the hallway, a group of women from the, were outside the day center from the recovery housing program. And one of them, whom I'd gotten to know the day she arrived from jail, it was a couple of weeks later and a number of, she was crying, a number of her peers were around and she was saying, I don't, you know, I just want to leave, I just want to go, she was having a bad day, she'd had a bad exchange with somebody and her peers were standing around her, all encouraging her, all, you know, all talking to her about, you know, all giving to her what she needed in that moment. Some of it I would have to say was some tough love and some of it was some, you know, very, 
a soft love, but she, but that's what community will do on its own. It that happens just by nature when you set the conditions in which people can heal. That's what people will do. Their leadership, their care for one another, and a beautiful um, epilogue to that story is that that same woman who decided to stay and stuck it out and was there for several several years and did it so so well. Um, was passing by me a couple days later and I was having a bad day and my head was down and I must have looked a little grouchy and she said to me as she was I passed her by she said hey pick your head up and I thought there that's an example of you know so we we pass it on we pass it on from from each uh, one of us from our ability to the next person in need and we need those opportunities to be of service to one another as well. I, it's, you know, when you're in clinical training in the, in the psych social work world, there's this issue of self-disclosure, and I call it an issue because I think it's really poorly offered in training spaces in terms of what it means to self-disclose with a client, if it's valuable, and what it means for you to be able to share your humanity with a client and how that can be helpful. And I can't help but not think of that as well, is that the value in a couple, what Dr. Vincent has said about her own, your own experience, you know, of what drives you and being a mentor to up and rising professionals as well, who come from similar backgrounds for you to show the way, right? That is a self-disclosure. We've, you've all self-disclosed here. And yet we have this fear of identifying with each other, which I think is something that is being called into this environmental support discussion is what happens if we actually choose to identify with one another? Would that make these conversations actually easier? Do would we feel that some of that tension of how will I be received then kind of becomes normalized, right? Because isn't that what someone is experiencing when they're released from prison? How will I be received? Um, and we experience that on the clinical side too, is how will I be received if I answer this question with a true answer about myself, right? And I share something that I might be feeling that I happen to be seen on a bad day. So, you know, that was something that I, I'm thinking of is really, really powerful in what you're all saying. But Alexis too, I wanna hear from you, who needs to be at the table? You know, peer recovery is a big one I'm hearing. The in inclusion of family experience is a big one I'm hearing. What else do you think? Yeah, I, I think that, um, you know, as I, I started as a frontline worker, I, I experienced the challenges that existed as policies were rolled down or, you know, decisions were made and what seemed to be a process that made sense at the top once it got actually down to the people who had to maneuver and navigate the process had a lot more challenges than folks had meant um, for it to have. And so I think that the importance of a front line, the front line is, is absolutely necessary in addition to peers. So I know that when I worked with Indiana Department of Correction, one of my favorite roles while I was an executive um, was to be able to go out into the field and talk to the people who were doing the work. And I, oftentimes I would hear people say like, I'm just a, right? Like my title is I'm just a. And, um, you know, I often tried to make sure to correct that person because you're not just a caseworker was, you know, the language that we use or just a case manager, you know, you're a person who's fulfilling a very important role. And, and I'm just the person and who needs to be able to take what makes your job work or not work and communicate it up to the higher levels to see how we can make changes that make it more useful or more strict, seamless or, you know, more, more helpful to the clients that you're serving. And, and, you know, to Dr. Vincent's point, having champions throughout my career were very important. I hope that I served as a champion to other people and lifted their voice and gave them the opportunity to speak. And so when we talk about who needs to be at the table, we do need the people who are the decision makers, the people who can kind of keep the ball rolling. But we also need the people who can sit there and say, I understand what you're trying to do, but this isn't how it works in practice, right? These are the barriers we run up against. These are the, the complexities that you, as the leadership role, don't understand because you aren't doing this on a daily basis. And so you don't necessarily know kind of the small pieces of this process that we run up against. And how can we remove those barriers and those challenges to the process to make it work how you think it's working? And so I think people with lived experience, I think people have to, who are the ones picking up the, the phone and calling the other resources and saying, I have this client that needs enrolled and they understand all of these kind of challenges and hurdles that 
the folks who set the policy or the process in motion don't don't have an understanding or working knowledge of. They may think that they do, and they're well intentioned. And I've definitely been in that role before, where I thought, well, this makes sense, right? I'm going to do this and this and this, and so why doesn't it work? And you know, we need those those leaders who are humble enough to understand that they don't understand how everything works, and that sometimes what they think they're putting into place to make something easier is actually making things harder for everyone. And they need to be able to hear that and they need to have people that they can ask, did I make this easier? Is it working how it's supposed to, or is it not practical at all? And I'm just kind of saying it is. <laughs> yeah, a comment in the chat that said policy isn't always practical. And I'm inspired to ask if each of you could consider one legislative need that could be changed, right? One legislative policy that could be changed. Um, one I heard is the asterisk and, and the different categories that it applies to, but are there other policies you think of that would just dramatically open opportunities for folks who are justice involved? And what are they? Jason, go for it. I can share, I can share my experience. So I, I'll say this, when I was incarcerated in California, they passed a measure called Proposition 57. And this proposition basically incentivized rehabilitative programming. So if people engaged in self-help groups or vocational training, um, stayed out of trouble for a period of time, they could actually earn time off their sentences. And the rate of like people enrolling in college and getting their GEDs and, and getting vocations and participating in self-help programs went through the roof because people are, I mean, this is just, uh, I think it's a general truth about humanity. We're like incentive-based, like what's our ROI? Like, what do I get out of doing this? So while someone might initially in their early 20s, you know, begin their experience of incarceration and say, hey, I'm going to take these classes to knock some time off my sentence. Somewhere along the way, they're learning, they're, they're growing, they're rehabilitating, right? I think the same is true in society. When we're talking about property owners, landlords, incentivizing programs for justice-involved people who don't have rental history. Um, and in, I think there's always going to be a creative way to incentivize employers, housing providers to get involved in this conversation of second chances or fair chances for people who are coming home from incarceration. And I, I it's, it seems innovative, but it's so straightforward. And I really appreciate that. Um, what are, what are other legislative ideas, Dr. Vincent? Yeah, so thinking about that incentive, incentive alignment on the mental health care side. Right, so I've, I've been on panels with, with peers and folks who have this great experience to share, but uh, because their state doesn't reimburse for their services, the clinics don't keep them on, right? Mm -hmm. And so we need to make sure that um, they are able to get reimbursed for the service they are providing and that that service is appropriately valued. Um, and, and that's a, a big one. And then when we're thinking about healthcare more broadly, um, and the proportion of people who are criminal justice system involved who are reliant on Medicaid for their mental health care services, um, Medicaid service rates that are far below what private service rates are that don't even cover cost of services are a tremendous barrier uh, for that population when it comes to just being able to, to get what they need. I think too, someone at a conference recently accounted for as well, like what happens, you know, when you are in medical school uh, and you may, what my friends used to call moonlight, you know, in order to make some extra cash, but you're going to work at a community setting likely um, where you can be a per diem psychiatrist or social worker. And the re even the reimbursement there is so much lower. So what we're doing to the providers to give them a, a space to say that this, we see this career path as valuable as becoming a, a specialty clinician um, or having your own private practice is something that I think is coming to mind there too. Schroeder, other uh, legislative ideas you think of? Well, mostly I think I would just wanna double down on what um, Jason and Dr. Vincent were saying that we, that any, any of these ban the box uh, elements or thing, ways that we take away the, um, these, prohibitions for people to get back into employment and into housing so disallowing discrimination in employment or checking of criminal background checks and things like that i think that's very important and to dr vincent's point making sure that medicaid rates are 
are, are reasonable, making sure that we're covering peers with in, in Medicaid so that um, uh, people like uh, Jason and Crop can do work um, and be reimbursed for it. And also making sure that people are connected to health insurance before they leave so that they can go right into the whatever health care supports they need, even if they're not perfect, at least they've got an anchor. Yeah, it's like treating the prison like a hospital discharge plan the same way if someone's being released from hospital with the resources that are necessary. Yeah. Alexis, anything that you feel your colleagues missed that you want to chime in for? I mean, they definitely hit most of the big ones. You know, I think the last few years have forced us to be a little bit more progressive in a lot of ways that, especially in the field of corrections, we may not have gotten there as quickly as we were forced to. And one of those things is telehealth and, you know, meeting people where they are. And so I know that there are a lot of waivers um, in place right now. And will they stay, you know, as we continue to lift restrictions from the pandemic? I don't know. I hope that they do. You know, we've been very restrictive in corrections in general. You know, we're kind of rule bearing people. That's where we're most comfortable. And so, you know, if you need to see your probation officer, you need to see your probation officer right there in person. Um, and is that necessary? Is that really meeting the client where they are? Is it really in best case scenario for them to need to leave their job, to fight traffic, to get it across town, to look you in the face and tell you, I've got a job, I'm doing well, and then do the same on the way back? Or can they do that via a Zoom call um, or a FaceTime? You know, what are ways that the system can better adapt to being supportive of someone's re-entry efforts instead of restrictive of them? And I'm hoping that some of the things that we were forced into practice uh, may remain after we continue to lift restrictions and, and legislatively remain, especially in terms of telehealth. So I think that's a good transition to just ask you all the last two years transformed our entire social service system due to COVID-19. I think none of us uh, were trained to work in that environment, let alone think about how we navigate as humans during a clearly ongoing pandemic. How do you think COVID-19 has changed the way you imagine solutions for the justice involved in your role? Um, you know, tell me what, what this experience has been like for you and, and maybe where you see some room for hope. Jason, go ahead. Sure, okay. So I, I paroled on April 2nd, 2020. Wow. Yeah, the, the governor ordered Governor of California ordered my immediate release on March 27th, and I came home on April 2nd. So it was right at the start of the pandemic. Um, you know, it was definitely an interesting time uh, coming into a society that I had been separated from for 20 years and then being on a different form of lockdown. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. A lot of people talking about, oh, we're on lockdown. And, you know, for me, it was like, you know, you're not on lockdown. <laughs> <laughs> This is not lockdown. You, you're, you know, it's a, it's a beautiful world. It was actually for me. It was, a, it was a unique experience, in the sense that while the, I was trying to catch up to the world, and the world itself was forced to slow down. Mm -hmm. So, um, it was helpful for me. When it comes to my work, um, we we came to, uh, this to this reimagining of reentry, the creation of this holistic reentry program that provides people with the mindset, skill set, employment, and housing, all, mm -hmm. all in one a one stop shop for reentry. And around this time last year, we said, you know, we want to launch a, a, a pilot, but obviously COVID was still a, a very a very real thing. Um, we had recruited 15 justice involved individuals and we did this six month virtual pilot virtually. And what I came to find out was that people who are justice involved and are looking for an opportunity to upskill and, and find a, create a better life, a better future, are willing to endure uh, you know, four hours a night on Zoom, five nights a week with me. <laughs> it's, it's all order right <laughs> so so what what the pandemic showed me was that now so currently we have as i shared earlier we partner with the state of california and we will be running a residential program in the bay area where we will be housing justice involved individuals and providing nine months of training uh, to upskill them and get them into high paying careers in tech and knowledge-based sector as well as uh permanent housing on the back end but in la we're running a satellite program that we are very likely going to run a hybrid model because we don't have the residential front end piece down there. 
Um, so that is something that COVID has shown me um, that it's very possible and, and feasible to utilize the virtual landscape um, to equip people to succeed in the community. I think that's resonating with a lot of folks. I think telehealth has definitely changed access and, and what that means for, for people across all uh, disciplines and walks of life. Who else? How has COVID-19 maybe helped you reimagine your role? I think, what, you know, some of the, we, at Mental Health America, we collect real-time data that from our free anonymous screening program. So we had data point, and we get about 15,000 people a day coming to screen themselves for some form of mental health concern. And two of them are in Spanish, by the way, and people have the option to leave demographics, their age, their zip code, et cetera, but they don't have to. Um, and so we were able to watch in real time what was going on with the, with the American population at large, or at least with those people who were help seeking um, during that time. And on every indicator, on every indicator, things went down. So that we, we just know that this has been a, a really collective experience. For some, obviously outright traumatic, for some at minimum disruptive and, and, and troubling, but, but for many, extremely difficult. And especially what we've been able to see is I think the pandemic has just put an X-ray on our disparities and our health disparities, our mental health disparities, we see very clearly who are the people most at risk through our screening program, their youth, for one, we're very concerned about youth, but youth in particular who identify as Black, African American, multiracial, or LGBTQ. Um, and across the board, those are those turn up as risk factors where people leave demographic information. So we've seen it. We see it in our own data. We've read. All of us have 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 watched this. Um, so I think my my real hope is that this is going to be the the lesson that we've learned around the social conditions, the importance of the social conditions to thrive, and whether this is about tackling systemic racism or whether this is about job security and um, em employment for people or healthy neighborhoods or not letting your zip code determine your health outcome. You know, I hope that we really see how this the, in this moment, the clarity of that picture and hold on to it for um, to make progress. And I really believe it's going to have to start at the community based level and the, and the state level where where we make progress i think right now it's harder to make progress from the federal level and policy perspective on these things but um we're hopeful for um that you know that these community solutions that we know exist and work like crop and like what jason is doing um or like what n street village does we we know these things work and so we need to scale them excellent alexis dr vincent yeah, so um, I actually, after a decade plus with the state of Indiana, took on this new role with Gateway and relocated my life. And then 10 days later, the world locked down. And so I started this new role. Uh, the entire time has basically been during the pandemic. And so it, it was very interesting to get to bring my perspective into this role and to get to see the different ways, you know, Gateway provides um, SUD and, and a variety of the reentry style treatment in different correctional settings. And so watching in all of our different markets, how that market responded to the pandemic, ways in which they were um, willing to be creative and the ways that we were able to provide treatment, whether that be telehealth, whether that be take home packet, whether that be, you know, still in person, but with, you know, six feet distance or smaller group setting, um, just watching everything develop and how that works and um, how some places were more restrictive and some places were more creative. And that's that's been a great way to see where we have room to find ways to meet clients where they are, where we have room and opportunity to offer treatment in a slightly different format than what we're used to. You know, obviously the data has shown that in-person engagement is best, but that's not the only. And so finding ways in which we can look over the past couple of years and say, what, where did we see improvement in engagement? Where did we see improvement in client rapport or in you know, progress in their treatment? And, and 
could we contribute that to things that we were doing that were different from how we would have traditionally been operating if we weren't in a pandemic? And so, you know, we spent a lot of time looking back through and identifying ways in which we saw improvement. And we also spend that time looking back to see ways in which, you know, that creative approach may not have been as, as good as what we had hoped and how can we improve on that while still finding ways to meet the client where they are and provide the quality of treatment that we're dedicated to provide. So yeah, it's been, it's been very intriguing and very interesting in the last couple of years. Definitely reimagining the concept of perfect practice. Dr. Vincent, we'll give you the final way in. Well, I think echoing what everyone said, but I think in terms of just a shift, right? Like the, we do this because we've always done it this way was just completely blown up the past few years. And one of the things that has come up a lot in um, some of my you know, trainings with judges and, and partnerships with them is, you know, this is really an opportunity to rethink from top to bottom how we work, um, to think about what's worked well, um, and to really take advantage of the fact that we're all in this space where we're not just assuming what has always been is what is helpful. Um, and even you know, on the juvenile side, we released a lot of kids because they actually didn't need to be there in the first place, right? And so what lessons do we take from that um, moving forward and how do we capture that and um, you know, not let this be a, a blip, but really, really learn from it. Excellent. Um, I'm going to just close us for the day looking at the time. Our panelists, thank you so much for your candor, for your expertise, for your passion, humanity you brought to today's discussion. I really thank you for being champions of equity and leaders in this movement. Um, I'll close for with a few final words as this remarkable series comes to an end for us here at the Kennedy Satcher Center. In one week, we will commemorate the anniversary of George Floyd's murder. It is also Mental Health Awareness Month, something that we here renamed last year Mental Health Equity Month. And our news recently has been wrought with uh, violent realities of the, la of the lasting legacy of racism, oppression, poverty, discrimination it has on our society. And what we've learned in this series is that a trauma-informed prison doesn't exist, but a trauma-informed community does. Um, successful and meaningful solutions to reducing rates of incarceration in our country must begin in the community and family. It was consistent in all five. These solutions must also be applied at a young age, right? We have to start seeing youth as potential to thrive from the beginning. We learned that our system truly has not treated all with the same compassion and rehabilitation. And through our leaders of lived experience, we broke down and dismantled misunderstanding, stereotypes and stigma attached to being incarcerated. I wanna especially thank this audience for choosing to be a part of this because that in itself was an action of advancing equity. You decided to inform yourself and improve your understanding of how closely related our carceral and our public health systems are. You are also champions of equity. And I know that this series is coming to a close. It only opens the next chapter in our work to advance criminal justice reform and equity for all here at the Kennedy Satcher Center. Stay tuned for future events and programming for us, one of which is our next big project is tackling the experience of justice involved with 988. You can visit us at kennedysatcher.org for more information. Please also follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn at Satcher Health Leadership Institute. Thank you once again to WellPath Cares Foundation for this generous sponsorship for this initiative. I wish you all health, safety, and wellness as we push onwards in our quest for equity for all. Thank you so much and take care.